Hello, folks. Welcome to another episode of Cockroach DB Bytes. I'm your host, John St. John. This is the architecture series. We are moving into discussions about the transaction layer. Uh, I'm going to give you a little view of where that's at. So we're in the yellow right now. Transaction layer. Uh, let's just jump right into it. Uh, skip the overview. Let's just let's just dig right in. So what does the transaction layer do in, in CockroachDB? Well, it receives incoming KB operations generated by the SQL layer. And it also ensures the atomicity of transactions. So uh, all transactions in CockroachDB are asset compliant. So they um, are either committed or aborted and there's no middle state. Uh, during um, the uh, transaction layer also maintains serializable isolation from other transactions. So Serializable isolation is the highest transaction uh, ANSI SQL transaction isolation level. And in serializable, uh, even though transactions are run concurrently and in large clusters massively concurrently, they will appear as if they were uh, only one was run at a time. So they can be basically like stacked in order. Um, if you were to stack them end to end, they would uh, essentially, uh, even though they're, they're executed concurrently, they would appear as if they were had a strict ordering to them. And then also, once the transaction layer is done, it sends KV requests to the distribution layer. So there's three transaction phases that we typically talk about. So there's the writes and reads. And for writes, there are locks that are created and transaction, as well as transaction records. And we'll talk about uh, the types of locks, but one uh, in particular that we'll talk about a lot is write and tense. Um, and then for both reads and writes, trans, uh, transaction conflicts are negotiated during this first phase. And then in the second phase is where the commit happens, and uh, we'll check the transaction record, handle any aborted transactions, and also change the record state to changing, uh, sorry, staging, the transaction record state to staging. And then during the cleanup, which runs asynchronously, then the transaction state is moved to committed and uh, any write intents are resolved and deleted. So what are write intents? So write intents are values that are written to a provisional state in the storage layer. Uh, so <clears throat> they're really this combination of a replicated lock and a replicated provisional wrap value. Um, it, any operations that encounter write intents have to look up the status of the transaction in the transaction record. So on the right, we can just see a write intent in MVCC where we have uh, at a timestamp 50 an original value, um, at timestamp uh, 322 old, 400 current, and then 500. We are trying to uh, update row the row with key A uh, with proposed, but We've put this intent uh, into the MVCC key space that just says, hey, this is our proposed value, but this is just an intent. Uh, and then it'll exist for the life of the transaction until that third phase of cleanup. So another concept that's uh, important to understand in transactions are closed timestamps. And uh, each range, we talked about ranges as a contiguous uh, logical chunk of data tracks a closed timestamp, a time at which no writes can occur at or below. So this closed timestamp is advanced continuously uh, on, on the leaseholder and sent to its replicas. So uh, it generally occurs a few seconds in the past and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about follower reads, but it's the way that we can ensure that no new changes are gonna be introduced um, at, the, at a, a, a more recent point of time. So um, I know after a few seconds in the past that that history of data for that particular range is uh, essentially immutable at that point. So that enables us to do things like you know, follower reads and, and those type of things. Um, you know, there's a number of different optimizations that are made at the transaction layer. And I just want to touch on uh, one of them, which is called parallel commits. And their parallel commits are part of an optimized atomic commit protocol that cuts the commit latency of a transaction in half. Uh, 
from two rounds of consensus to one. So on the left, we essentially see that uh, we're, we have a transaction that, oh, let me get rid of my image. We see that there's, we have a begin, then we write apple, write berry, and then commit. So without parallel commits, this transaction record that we had mentioned before is written after the individual writes are committed. So we're able to um, write apple and write berry simultaneously, but we have to wait for both of those return to return before we can write the transaction record. Um, and then we talked about that asynchronous uh, resolution of intents that happens. Um, but so what we see is that essentially uh, you know, when the client writes this, they, they wait until uh, that transaction record is returned before they can return to the client for control to be able to do other transactions. And then this async happens kind of away from the client control and the cleanup. So with parallel commits, uh, we still uh, write the apple and the berry values in parallel. But what we're also able to do is write the transaction record immediately, even before those uh, two um, operations return. And we write that with a, uh, a status of staging. So uh, we don't, um, staging is a special value that says, uh, you know, if everything goes through successfully, then um, we can consider this committed and then we can return directly back to the client. Um, and then asynchronously, uh, we're, we're able to update that transaction record to commit it and resolve the intents, and et cetera. So uh, the key here is just that parallel commits is one of many, many optimizations that allow us to do a lot of work in parallel. So transaction layer, in the transaction layer, we also deal with transaction conflicts and uh, transaction conflicts occur um, when a transaction in encounters a write, and the following types of conflicts can occur. So there's a write-write conflict, and these happen on the same keys. So if there are two pending transactions create write intents for the same key, then that would be considered a conflict. So uh, in that previous MVCC example, we saw you know with key A, we had this provo proposed value. Well, if another write comes in and sees that write intent, then uh, that's going to create a create a conflict, um, and then uh, write write followed by a read. If uh, if a read encounters an existing write intent with a timestamp less than its own, uh, then that would be considered a conflict. So additionally, uh, there are the following types of conflicts that do not involve encountering a write uh, write intent uh, arise. And that's when there's a write uh, after a read, when a write has a lower timestamp and encounters a later read. Uh, and then also read with uncertainty window, when a read encounters a value with a higher timestamp, but it's ambiguous whether the value should be in the future or in the past of the transaction because of po possible clock skew. So that the latter one really refers to, um, so uh, in a distributed system, uh, there's a need to synchronize clocks across uh, disparate nodes, and uh, we have a maximum allowable clock skew. Um, by default, it's 500 milliseconds for multi-region clusters. It's typically set to 250 milliseconds, um, and that represents uh, an uncertainty window. Um, so clock skew can create a situation where um, there's it's ambiguous whether or not the uh, read uh, happens uh, before the write, like the timing isn't really clear. So. Um, conflicts are just in contention are just a part of any database system. So it's not that we need to strictly avoid all transaction conflicts. In fact, CockroachDB uh, in, in many cases will use, uh, will internally retry transactions, uh, particularly when we're using implicit transactions. Um, however, uh, we recommend that clients are designed to handle retries. It's really important. Um, because uh, whether it's an implicit or explicit transactions, uh, there are different types of serializable you know, errors and transaction conflicts that need to be retried by the client. And that's a little different than uh, uh, folks that come from an environment where maybe they're using like a, a re recommitted 
uh, level of transaction isolation where those might be a little less frequent. Um, serializability gives us uh, you know, a higher consistency for data, but also requires us to uh, handle certain types of uh, exceptions that can be, be returned from the database. So that's a really quick overview of the transaction layer. In the next talk, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the distribution layer. Uh, thanks for joining and uh, look forward to seeing you in the next session. Thank you.